this. All right, good. All right, well, today's speaker is uh, Dr. Steve Weichsel. Um, he's an assistant professor of science and technology at Bryant University. Um, he earned his bachelor's degree from the University of New Hampshire, and I, I just learned is actually a, from Michigan originally. So he traveled out to New England for his, his undergraduate, so he can go snowboarding apparently. Um, and he then earned his PhD from the University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester, Massachusetts, which we are fondly remembering. Um, before arriving at Bryant in 2019, uh, Dr. Weichsel held a postdoctoral position at the Yale School of Medicine and was a visiting assistant professor at Providence College. Um, Steve explores the molecular mechanisms of metazoan development, primarily how chromatin organization regulates gene expression during embryogenesis. At least that's what his uh, Bryant website says. Um, for today's brown bag seminar, uh, he will talk about some ongoing research in his lab on the impacts of microplastics on aquatic vertebrate development. So Steve, it's all yours. Awesome, thank you. All right, so let's uh, let's navigate the, uh, the screen share. Do, 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 do. Sorry, I'm of course it's just like PTSD from last fall. All right, so uh, all right, what am I? Yes, this is what I'm gonna share. All right, so everyone sees my screen. Is that is that did I do it right? All right, good. Uh, so so thanks, Jim. Uh, I um, like to see the see see a couple faces. I know I'm relatively new to EPSCoR. I've been uh, trying to. I've been usually I'm on the other side of the table on the on the Embry side. Um, as Jim mentioned, a lot of my um, a lot of the work that I do focuses on molecular mechanisms of gene regulation. Um, and metazone, and you know, we like to focus a little bit on, on more on the vertebrates. And you know, I have my, my background here has my 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 favorite uh, vertebrate, the, the zebrafish. Uh, and we look primarily with the work that we've been doing is looking at gene regulation and how it um, and how it is affected by chromatin architecture and three dimensional um, organization of our of our chromosomes within within the nucleus and. Um, we have some really cool um, preliminary stuff on this, looking at these three-dimensional um, structures. We have these cool tools that we can use in zebrafish that we'll talk, that I'll bring up a little bit later because it'll, it'll apply to um, what we're doing with microplastics, but we can use in situ hybridization. If you're not familiar with this technique, this is a way of looking at RNA within an organism. So this is so these purple bands are different genes. Um, and each are sta staining a different portion of the hindbrain, which is a region of the, the, um, the central nervous system in which different um, facial motor neurons are born um, that innervate into um, vertebrate face and neck. And so we have some really cool tools that we can use to look at gene expression and um, kind of tissue development in developing embryos. So we're hoping um, that we can use and kind of, you know, parlay into this, um, this study that we we're doing with um, CAIM and EPSCoR, looking at the effects of microplastics on vertebrate development. So we, uh, so talking to this group, I don't think I need, it's too much of a stretch to, um, <laughs> to illustrate that microplastics are bad. Um, they, they are a new, at least, um, funding in the sense of funding and emerging um, concern. It's something that's been around since plastics have been around. Um, but what we know is that um, microplastics disrupt um, aquatic ecosystems. And this can happen multiple ways um, from the introduction. And so we have multiple introductions, of land route or just pollution, um, pollution by, by, by waterways. Uh, introduction of, of plastics and other toxins into, into our water systems, in which case these at, at all levels, all trophic levels, um, can have an effect. Um, it, they, can set, they can sediment into the, to the ocean floor, um, which they can be then fed upon um, by, by lower trophic consumers, primary consumers, which then um, you know, can be eaten by secondary and, and higher level um, trophic consumers um, to, to um, it, 
to affect in in the way toxicity um, poison these other these, these higher organisms. And they also provide these, these interesting environments um, for biofilms, which can increase um, pathogenetic um, bacteria within, within aquatic systems, which then can then go off and be detrimental to aquatic life as well. And if that wasn't good enough um, for you as an example, um, I'm sure you're all aware that the, the, <laughs> the microplastics themselves have toxic um, cap um, potential to, to leach and um, relieve chemicals as well as absorbing and um, deabsorbing um, these chemicals into the environment, transferring these chemicals. So overall, right, um, microplastics bad. Um, and so we look at this problem Sorry, if I go forward. Um, in our lab, very simplistic, because again, I'm a, I'm a molecular science guy, right? So um, this organismal stuff is, is really great, and I'm going to leave it to the expert. For, but for to me, um, I look at this and I see two, two issues, right, for, for organisms in, in, in our ecosystems, is that um, we can have exposure um, for mycoplastics that cause acute um, organismal level toxicity, right? So this is organisms running into plastics within their environment um, or in internally um, ingesting plastics, either by eating the plastic itself or eating something that has the plastic, right? So that's the, the first way we can, I, I look at this, right? Second way is that the in the environment, right? We have um, toxicity to, to the offspring, right? So I, I, I I think of these as two separate things, right? This is toxicity within a, in a, in a developed organism versus one that's developing. And this can happen one of two ways. This can happen internally, depending on the type of um, reproduction that the, the organism has, or this can be external, right? So this is something where the embryo runs into these toxic, um, into this toxic environment based on the microplastics. Um, if you were to guess what my my area that I'm most interested in, it's it's this one, this external exposure to embryos. So when when you think about what we're doing, most of our experiments are going to focus on this type of exposure. Um, and so so the research that's that's been done in microplastics, it's actually as, as I mentioned, it's it seems to be an emerging um, focus, even though it's a an area that's been a problem for a very long time. And if you look at the papers, this is, this is taken one from environmental toxin pharmacology, kind of summarizes what people are looking at. You know, they're looking at size of plastics um, and, you know, then basing, basing off of these, the, this, the size versus um, kind of avenue of toxicity, looking at ingestion, we start to break these down into molecular cellular effects, systemic effects, um, and something that has to do with, with some of the, the endpoint of the organismal development. Um, again, the ones that are most exciting to me that, you know, taken my expertise are things that we look at and want to look at are things that affect gene expression and cell signaling, um, as well as reproduction. And so our question, um, and where where we're going with this, right? And so today we're we're kind of talking about our plans because we are we are relatively new to the Epsport group and trying to get things off the ground. Um, but we are we are wondering how um, plastic exposure in the environment affects the vertebrate development in the bay. And so we've kind of focused in on two um, two in, um, native species of. Of fish here, the silver sides and, and killifish. Um, for those of you who don't know what these look like, they're they're relative, they're about the same size. They're anywhere from five, based on my research, about five inches on average long, um, which for me is a huge fish. Um, so we, we put the, the inch bar up here just, just so you know. This is a this is a silver, silver size. It's a killifish. Killifish, there's there's multiple, and I'm not, so I mean this is my ignorance, but I'm not. I'm not exactly sure exactly which ones we have in the bay. These are this is an example of the, the Atlantic silver sides, um, which can be found all along the coast, stretching into Connecticut as well. Um, so we our, our approach, and um, I, saw, I saw Kathleen on, on the call. So, so Kathleen, just so you know, I will be contacting you about, about some embryos for silver silver sides. Um, we uh, we our plan is to expose embryos. Um, particularly, we're going to start with the silver sides. 
um, to various um, microplastics. So one of, um, this is something that is kind of interesting if you look at um, the literature and research that's done, been done uh, for most of you that are looking at microplastics, you know it's kind of all over the place of what people are treating with for plastics. Um, and it's kind of an important question or important um, thing to think about because many of these plastics have different characteristics in the water systems, right? So we're, we're starting with polyethylene, one, because it's one of the largest used within the industry. The other is the density um, provides it with a, enough a weight to kind of sink um, in, in our waterways, which again, if we're, we're, we're looking at embryonic development based on um, spawning behavior of our fish, most of our embryos are gonna be at the bottom um, opposed to the top of the water system. So where the most toxic effects are gonna be where, where hopefully the, the polyethylene is. And so we're gonna expose these embryos um, and potentially younger larval stages um, to various mic um, to, to microplastics. And our, the, the goal is to identify changes in embryonic development, right? And for this, we're gonna, again, look at gene expression, um, morphology, we can look at hatching rates to kind of get at um, how, how these embryos are affected. Um, and in another little, looking at some metabolism aspects um, within um, the fish, we're hoping to um, collaborate with um, a colleague here at Bryant, Dr. Chris Reed, um, who you know is um, very, very good at looking at constellation. Um, and he has some tools for labeling, labeling different types of, of sugars that we can see if um, within these embryos we're seeing changes um, in the glycosylation um, based, on, um, based on microplastic exposure. All of these, all of these things um, that we're going to be looking at in base-specific fish have actually already been done in something that um, it segues good into to some human health questions as well. Many of these things have already been done in zebrafish. Um, and so being a zebrafish researcher, and you know, this is kind of where my wheelhouse, um, you know, we feel very confident that we can do similar experiments that have already been done in zebrafish, kind of use them as controls um, to kind of give us a foothold on, you know, kind of the genes that we're looking at. Um, gene groups and genes that we're looking at um, that might be upregulated, downregulated based on microplastic um, exposure, changes in morphology, what we'll be looking at, hatching behaviors, things like this. And um, for those of you that aren't familiar, as familiar um, with zebrafish as a model organism, it is a well-established model organism for toxicity. Um, all, all over cancer drugs are tested sometimes, um, oftentimes in zebrafish, um, heavy metals, other, other types of, um, other types of environmental um, chemicals that we look at toxicity are, are done in zebrafish. Many of these things are because zebrafish um, lend themselves well to, to um, these, these types of studies because they have external fertilization of embryos. So we can get from any female embryo or female um, zebrafish, up to 200 embryos um, every week. So if you imagine we, in our colony, um, we have had at times up to 100 females. Um, that's a whole lot of embryos that you can get rather quick. Um, so your N value, right, um, is rather high. And looking at the microplastic data, again, there's a lot of um, homology or orthology um, between zebrafish and other vertebrates, such as humans. Um, so people have been using zebrafish for quite a while, looking at um, the effects of microplastics. Um, so here, these, this is indicating, um, this is a larval zebrafish, um, and they're, they're indicating spots um, within the organism. This is, was a, this is taken from a review looking at different types of studies, and this is looking at the ingestion of microplastics and where they ended up in, um, in the developing um, embryo, looking at different sizes. So these are, these are actually nanoplastics, anywhere from 20 to 200 nanometers and anything greater than 200 nanometers um, by these icons here. And they've looked at um, other things such as locomotion, so we can track and watch um, these, these larval fish actually swim um, really easily. Uh, check out heart rate. They see lots of changes in heart rate. 
um, as well as other type of um, physiological processes, primarily looking at gene expression. Um, over here, I put on the right hand side, I just put a list. It's just, you know, the, the standard bulk. It's not supposed to do anything but be like, oh, wow, look at all of the, all of the research been done already in zebrafish for microplastics. Um, you can see, again, this is something that's happened relatively recently. Um, there's a whole lot of papers out there that have looked at this. So we feel really good um, in the sense of discovering something for bay fish. Um, to have a good starting point and kind of a launching point for things to look at and at least compare um, what we get from. Uh, one of the take homes, and I think that this is something that we're, um, I, I use we as the royal we, I'll talk about um, the student in just a second that, that is taking on this project. Um, in these two columns here, you can see that this is C is standing for concentration of plastic versus the size of the plastic. And you can see that those, those vary wildly from study to study. So this is one of the things I think is the most, one of the confounding um, variables, right, of any study and kind of a caveat of what you do is, is determining what is important physiologically um, for what we're testing. So it's one of the things that we, we have to work out um, as we go along. If, if you're interested, the rest of this kind of talks about where they found the plastic based on embryonic development. So each of these is a particular part of the embryo. Um, this is for larval stages, looking at GI versus systemic po um, positioning of the plastic. And then of course, the, the value of N, and you can see that um, N in this case is actually not number of fish, but number of studies. So it's a little, a little deceiving there, but. Um, so we feel there's a lot of information that we can use. And so looking at zebrafish, so what we've done so far is just kind of seeing if this is something that's plausible and easy to do. Um, here are some quick comparisons of our zebrafish versus our silver sides. You can see that this is, again, our one-inch marker. Um, zebrafish would probably be a snack for, for our, our silver side buddies. Um, they're, on average, about an inch long. Um, opposed to five inches. So again, this is a, the, the silver size is kind of an intimidating fish for me. I'm much used to something that I, I can easily exert my dominance over. Um, the zebrafish are also a freshwater fish. And so this is something, um, you know, going forward that um, hopefully isn't another one of these variables and something that we have to look at. But again, um, given the the, the nature of zebrafish as a model, we hope that it's something at least can provide a baseline for what we're hoping or at least um, hunting to find within the silverfish. Um, fortunately, uh, something that also makes this good is that we, we can do some comparative genomics. Um, silver sides do have a published genome. Um, so that's good. So that's, you know, as we're trying to do again, molecular studies and understand some of the genes that are being expressed and some of our tools that we have for zebrafish, we might be able to use those in silver sides as well. And again, they like zebrafish also have an external fertilization. So getting um, embryos should be relatively straightforward, uh, opposed to doing some type of digestion or some or surgical means of um, extraction. All right. And so this is this is my my final slide. So if you're hopefully your soup hasn't cooled. Um, you can get back to it real quick. We we are again. This is this is just in the start. Um, over here is, is pictured um, Jillian Silvia. She's the um, the workhorse behind all of our uh, of this project here. And again, I put our goals in quotes because this is this is really Jillian's project. She's done a great job driving it and, and getting it going here. Um, but we're we're trying to set up. Um, you know, get the get the groundwork for what we're going to do. Um, probably during the rest of the year after the summer is provide our get our protocols ready for treatment of embryos. So one of those things I mentioned um, as we looked at all the studies, there's a wide range of different um, plastic sizes and um, plastic concentrations and treatments. So those are something that we have to figure out. There um, is actually some well-established protocols um, for fish embryo. It, it's actually called the fish embryo acute toxicity test. If you're interested in, in hearing, if you haven't heard about this, here's the citation is down here. It talks about a 96 hour um, test um, to exposure test that basically 
um, is meant to be a standard for looking at um, toxic effects on, on fish. So we're, we're kind of starting there to see if that's something that we can expand upon and, and use as is a repeatable um, measure for toxicity with these microplastics. The other thing, so on top of treatment, um, is kind of perfecting and developing our tools, right? So one of the things that we really need to look at is, is the, the um, kind of the rate and the developmental staging of, of embryos between the two species. Um, some of our other tools that we like to use, like quantitative PCR, looking at gene expression levels, um, in situ hybridization to actually look at um, the embryos themselves. I think I have um, some more pictures of this, right? This is, this is again, this is our in situ um, picture. This is a picture of zebrafish embryos. Um, seeing if we can find equivalent um, developmental stages between the zebrafish and the silver sides, um, as well as, you know, can we can we move some of these tools that that um, quantitative PCR looking at gene regulation and C2 hybridization, can we can we move those over the silver sides? Um, mostly finding or orthologs from the zebrafish using the data that's already out there um, for what genes are affected by, by zebrafish. Um, microplastic exposure, can we also recapitulate this in silver sides? All right, so uh, again, this is Jillian. She's doing most of the work. She will be at the poster presentation um, at the end of the summer, so you should come check it out and see what she did. Um, other than that, um, that's all we got right now. If there's any questions, I am more than happy to, um... oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Colleen, I say Kathleen, I apologize. Um, but uh, if there's any any questions, I'm more than happy to take take them now. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I'll open up the, the floor first of our, our students and whatnot, or audience members who are here for um, for questions. But uh, I have I, I have one for sure. So uh, okay. if you got questions for Steve, uh, fire away. No questions? Okay. All right, well, I'll start off then. All right. So the microplastic sort of toxicity problem or the pollution of microplastics in the, in the bay or the oceans in general is when we're looking at this sort of effects you're thinking about for development of various fish, is, does, the, does the plastic pollution sort of a concentration yeah. in, the, in the water? And then how, like what number, what kind of levels are we looking at? And is it- Yeah, no, that, that's, uh, I, I, um, I totally agree with you with that. That's, that's, a, that's one of the things that makes this a little um, tricky, right? Um, the, the, and I think for, for me coming from something that's definitely more um, kind of bench science, right? In the controlled environment with the zebrafish, um, getting at something that actually is um, relevant to biology, right, is, is really important. And um, the uh, the um, kind of goal of figuring out what that what that is, I think you know, our initial, our initial experiments here that we're trying to get to this summer, just seeing if we can identify effects. Um, that, that kind of aspect that you're, you're asking, right, is, is an important one that we're going to have to measure and, and see exactly what, what, what is happening in, in say these spawning grounds, right, where, where embryos are, because it's, you know, it's, it, the ocean's big, right? <laughs> the bay is big enough. And so you're looking for two things. You're looking for accumulation of plastics and then accumulation of the toxic levels of the chemical to actually stick around long enough to make an effect. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, uh, I don't have a great answer for that other than because I don't, I don't know exactly what that is. Um, and, you know, to, to, to that will be something we have to address to, to make this relevant, right? I mean, it's not what it's, it, you know, the overwhelming observation is that plastics are bad. And, and so just by putting plastics next to embryos and saying like, look, it makes them, makes them messed up um, is, is an observation, but um, how important that is, um, I think depends on what's happening out in the bay. And so I, I imagine too in the bay, it's, it's, or any ocean system, it's gonna be um, 
the, the concentration of, of various microplastics will be determined by currents and it, it's not going to be equally dispersed in the water right so it's going to be really tricky to kind of yep you're you're going to deal you're like you're, you're going to deal with different different um types of plastics you're going to deal with different um types of um toxins and the, as you mentioned there's going to be um variation in the exposure time um the the just day to day minute to minute um exposure as well so so yes um it <laughs> that is uh i i like to i, I try not to the, the, those those parts make me nervous right yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I like the uh i like the um you know the controlled experiment where i i just need to make I need to get this embryo to five hours and then I, and then I pull out its, its genome to see what happened. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so this, this, this is a little more messy and, um, you know, I think first establishing our tools and kind of getting an idea for, for what those, what those levels are, um, that we see effects, um, we can then go from there and identify whether or not it's phys physiologically important. Yeah. Great. Thanks. All right, other questions? Looks like Jeff has his hand up. Um, sure. <laughs> I, I, no, I do. I just didn't want to jump on anyone else. Um, so uh, is, do you think the effects you're likely to see, or is there a literature on it, is it primarily chemical, or are these things sort of small enough in terms of development that they can actually interfere with what's going on with the embryo mechanically. So, so some of the, so a lot of the, so what I, where I got to um, kind of interested in this, right, is, is part of my own scientific bravado. So like looking, look, looking at these, these papers that came out um, for zebrafish development primarily, right? That's, that's kind of where I started. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they were showing these like monster embryos with these kink tails or, you know, like um, vastly maldeveloped um, up for a lack of anterior, anterior structures in the head. And, you know, I looked at those and, you know, being, being somebody that's, um, you know, I'm not exactly the greatest zebrafish husbandry <laughs> master, um, but with any clutch of embryos, you could find a certain number of, of embryos that look like what some of these pictures were. And the end values were so small that I was like, ah, you know, we got to look at this, right? Like, I, I have a feeling that, you know, that there's something, you know, that, that it's being missed here. So, so to your question, um, I, I think that they're going to be more subtle. I, I don't believe based on um, what, um, and, and again, this is, this is um, based on zebrafish, right? So, so zebrafish have a chorion. Um, I think I'm still sharing my screen. So if you see these pictures, right, that's in, for those that are unfamiliar with chorions, um, most uh, vertebrates, chordates have these. So they're like a little egg, shell for lack of a better word, but they're they're impervious to a lot of things. They're there for protection. Um, so we're gonna look at things that are that are small, right? I mean these are gonna be these are these are gonna be small chemicals that get in. And I think that it's and this is why I'm really interested in, in the gene side, this is going to be things that are affecting gene regulation mostly. Or not, I mean this is Right, but yeah, <laughs> I, I, I can pure conjecture. So th those are the things that uh, I'm. I think that we are going to see more out of based on um, the type of experiments that we do, rather than anatomical things. Um, I mean, it, there's a lot of data, and so I say that with the caveat that there is a lot of data um, that that recognizes um, big decreases in in hatch rates. Um, size embryo uh, you know larval size once they come out those are those are things that are also affected mm -hmm. um, so it, it's not that we're not going to see anatomical issues um, but I just think that the you know thinking about this the the um, the effects of the chemical are going to affect gene gene expression 
And we're also going to see levels, issues with stress, right? I, I think those would be, and, and for us, we're, our tools are going to look at that, the molecular side is, okay. is how we'll identify that. Cool. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, so did you find that like any certain types of plastics were like more toxic than like other types? Or is that more based on like size and like time of um, like exposure and stuff like that? Yeah, so based on, um, you know, so all of anything that I've known, right, kind of, you know, comes comes from the background and so they, that that background literature searches right and so this this review that we found um, really does a great job of kind of um, concentrating a lot of that and what's kind of interesting right is that um, again if we, we point out this chart you can see a concentration is kind of all over the place um, as well as a size right and so um, things that correlate well with with disruption, our our time of exposure, which I believe is one of your one of your questions, right? Time of exposure is a big one, um, and and concentration. What was interesting is that size of particle didn't really, and people you know think of this size as like amount as well, um, but size didn't really correlate, um, and so having more big pieces of plastic. Um, did not correlate with changes as much as more little pieces of plastic, right? So you know, I don't know if it's a surface area kind of thing. So um, as for types, I, I think that, you know, again, at this point, it's just like plastic's bad. So uh, as for a specific one, I'm not sure I could, I can really answer that. Okay. I hope that answered everything. Those are, I mean, those, those, are, those are really great questions, right? And I think that it gets at two, um, and, and what Jim, Jim is at, Jim is Dr. Lemire was saying, um, it's, a, uh, it's definitely a question, you know, in the day, right? You know, like what is going to be important for where, where these embryos respond, right? And so um, if, if is it, these, are, these are embryos that are found at the bottom, you're going to think of plastics that are more dense that are actually going to be there. Uh, polyethylene fits that bill. The fact that it's, you know, the one of the most highly used um, in the industry is a big thing. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of where we're starting. Okay, cool. Um, and then in addition, I'm wondering that like, um, due to like the gene expression changes from plastics, um, did you like study or see any effects in how like um, through either embryo or just through seeing like the embryo grow up into a um, parent fish or whatever, if the change in gene, gene expression, for example, made it a different size or something, if that had all negative effects or if like some of the changes ended up being um, making the species more like fit in some way or shape or form. Yeah, so I um so I haven't I haven't done this personally, right? But my my reading suggests that most of these effects um I guess are presumed to be detrimental, right? So there weren't any advantageous effects. And the things like size, decreased size of of the larva. Um, was not beneficial. And part of, part of this problem too, right? And, and this is, again, this is a controlled thing. So, you know, I, I think that's a great, a great caveat to this, you know, we're trying to model something that is very complex out in nature. And so there's going to be a lot of caveats with it. And you're just, you, you're either going to accept, you know, when you, when you see this data, right, you either accept it and be like, okay, this is, this is a model, right? Or, or you're going to be like, well, this is, this is, you know, a bunch of, you know, uh, a pipe dream of how this works because then nature just wouldn't wouldn't happen. And an example of what I'm trying to say is right that you know if we grow up small fish, small larva in a, in a clutch, and we allow them all to kind of grow, we we grow them in groups. Um, my guess is that small larva, um, based on what I've seen, especially the zebrafish, would start to get picked on. 
Um, they also wouldn't eat and be as fit as their um, as their clutch mates, right? And so eventually, those fish are definitely going to you know have issues. And and you can you can see that when you grow them up that many times that some of these, especially in zebrafish, um, the whole clutch will get to like an adult a, a proper adult stage, um, while some of these either slow developers, ones that, you know, hadn't eat as much are still, they're, they're looking almost sometimes a year to six months behind. Um, and they, they get picked on real easily and then eventually they, they disappear. So uh, <laughs> the, yeah, the zebrafish will eat each other, which is, you know, mildly um, terrifying. But um, the, uh, so, so yeah, so I, it wasn't explicitly stated that those were negative effects, but I can't imagine anything good happening um, from those delayed effects. Okay, thank you. Um, and mm -hmm. then also like further that question, do you think that it's possible maybe further down the line that to see um, like species of fish like this to adapt and overcome, like some species to adapt and overcome or like uh, evolved to have different strategies to dealing with plastics. Oh, that would be that would be really interesting, right? I mean, that I think falls in with um, many. You know, we can talk to uh, Dr. DeGeorgis, and I forget who is the colleague that's also working on that, right? But there's many um, bacteria, right, that have started evolving um, the ability to eat plastics. Um, you know that given how long plastics have been around and and the uh, I would have to confer with or defer I should say to microbiologists like maybe Dr. Pina that know a little bit more about <laughs> evolutionary um, aspects of, of microbial development but um you know those those guys are in a, a much faster developmental time or excuse me um, evolutionary time scale right so it would be fascinating to see, um, you know, on our time scale, if we could see fish do that, right? But, uh, you know, I think we're talking, you know, I mean, plastics will be around long enough, right, <laughs> to, to be a possibility. Um, so I'm not going to say that it's outside the realm of possibility, but, um, you know, if it becomes a strong enough selective pressure, uh, yeah, there's the potential for that, right? Cool. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Colleen, you had your hand up there for a while. Do you want to jump in? Sure. Uh, but you know, I'm happy for our wonderful interns to ask questions while we've got this opportunity. Um, if, if they want to, so you know, jump in. You know, go for it. There's every question is valid and important. Um, but I, I I can get started. But you know, thanks for that really interesting talk. It's uh, it, you know, it's interesting to kind of look at the uh, more sort of focused model species. It's kind of a, a step away from what I normally get involved with in my lab. Um, but I, I was just wondering really for the for the benefit of our intern community who are online now, like, um, could you talk a little bit about some of the uh, measures of controls that you need to do in the lab with this kind of work with microplastics, just so that students can understand that this is quite a big undertaking when, when we talk about microplastic exposures in a, in a simulated environment? Right. You know, this is um, this is something that, you know, when I first um, again, I, I kind of as I mentioned, coming from more of a molecular base basis and um, you know bench bench work kind of science opposed to in the field, um, talking and I coming to Bryant and um, colleague Chris Reed was like, hey, you know, like we we have this idea. At the time, we had a we had a, a term professor um, that was really good. Um, really big into microplastics, and he's like, we, we want it, we need an organism for this, right? And uh, like, zebrafish is known for toxicity, um, and this will be great. And I was like, perfect, you know, like, we'll, we'll do these things, and like, this sounds awesome. And then I started, you know, because it's like, oh, yeah, hey, let's like, at the time, um, our, our other colleague, he was um, taking plastics and shaving it with a, like a cheese grater, right, to make, it's a, I mean, not, not microplastics, I mean, these were macroplastics. And, um, and I was like, and I was like, this is great. This is, you know, you guys know what you're doing. And then I started getting into the literature and um, 
you know, it feels, this feels like compared to what I do um, for my chromatin studies, this feels like the wild west, right? Um, you know, you, like we know plastics are terrible, right? We, we know they're bad. And um, to me, you know, getting at controls, like we want to do the, we want to do this experiment in polyethylene. Cool. All right. So the, the first question is how big? How, how big is your mic? How, how big is your microplastic, right? And then, um, you know, so so you pick you pick this size, all right? Well, then how much of it are you going to put in there? And you're like, okay, well now we need to set up this concentration. And then, you know, to to Jim's point, then so what do we find in the ocean? And you're like, well, I don't know, <laughs> you know, like let's go let's go take a sieve and figure out how much is in the ocean. Well, that's that's for this spot of the ocean. What about this spot five minutes ago? Um, it, it quickly gets gets really out of control. Um, so I'm I you know you're asking about controls. What I what I want to do. Um, you know our my goal is to you know be. I, I think it's important to you know be upfront with what you do. Right. Clear to me, it's clear list of 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 indicate indicating what we're doing because. Um, I was just talking to Dr. Reed about this, Chris. Um, you know, one of the big other issues, at least that I see within microplastic research, right, um, is you you go you go to Sigma, you order polyethylene. That's great. Is that the same polyethylene that Dow Chemical used to make the bleach bottle that ended up in in the ocean? Um, maybe plus additives that you know Dow Chemical doesn't talk about. So you know. That that's another aspect of of something that you can't control um, that makes me a little nervous in these experiments. So you know, for for me, um, I think that it's you know something that you have to clearly define in your methodology, um, and I, I think it's something as a scientist, right, that you you always have to be aware of, right? What is what is my bias for this for this experiment? Um, what am I um, not ignoring, right? But what am I um, kind of giving back, um, or, or you know, what what aspect of control am I am I leaving behind and, and recognizing that? I think that's really important, and you know, that's one of the things that um, I think is is um, you know going forward for doing these these experiments that you know. Um, Comparing data to, to zebrafish and silver size might not be um, the best way to do it. Maybe there's different levels of toxicity between the two organisms that we don't quite understand. Um, the, those things I think are just parts that, you know, within your methodology you have to be really clear about and, um, you know, address or at least state. I, I, you know, I mean, I guess in, in my mind, that's, that's how I think about it. Yeah, I think I think I'm, I'm I was thinking more along the lines of how do you prove to the community uh, and increase awareness for our student community about not contaminating your own samples in the lab because that's the biggest danger because we work with fibers and with our everyday clothing we're walking contamination disasters because fibers shed from our clothing so it so I I, I think I was more interested uh, uh, to hear a bit more about that side to the benefit of our student community here. See, that's a that's a that's a great point to bring up, Colleen, <laughs> Which, um, because we we are still in in the points of figuring these out, figuring out these experiments. So these are those are those are things that um, we actually haven't um, we haven't addressed yet. Um, I I think that and I think that's a that's a great point. Um, you know, we we actually. Um, you know, these are these are our, ste our, our steps right now. Are kind of getting our tools together, so we haven't even come up with those with those steps yet, which is a great, which is a, you know, why why we'll be talking to to smarter people about this than than just leaving it up to us. Colleen, I guess I'm just. Are you suggesting that just general lab equipment, pipette tips, and and various bottles and whatnot could be another source of of the of the of the microplastic? Yeah, and, and 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 you know, Stephen, I'm not trying to like pick on anything here. Like, no. I, I've been at this point myself, so you know, I, I you know, we've definitely been through this, and and it's it's quite honestly, I'm going to be quite blunt here and British. 
it's a nightmare <laughs> it's, you have to have like like clean working facilities like you're working with dna extraction so Stephen, i know you've got a lot of like you know you do that um for sure uh and it's just about trying to remove uh i mean this is it, i guess it's easier in the lab when you have better control over what you're introducing to a in a kind of simulated environment because you you know it's a cleaner water sample but when you bring in messy gloopy um complex samples from the environment especially like sediments and seawater there's a lot of stuff in there and the the difficulty is is trying to isolate and extract these plastics but doing it in a meaningful manner so um, I'm going to drop a paper into the chat for for the benefit for like, for everyone for students. So I think this is a really interesting paper. I teach in plastics course um, in URI, and I, this is a paper I tend to bring to the attention. Um, but it brings some of the caveats of like the things that we need to address when working with plastics. And one thing to bear in mind is it's a new, like you said, it's a new field of research, and it's rapidly developing. There's no international standardized protocols for this. There are best practices. And that makes it hard and these uh, are, are rapidly changing so it's it's a difficult landscape to follow and keep up with um, but things like reagents they contain plastic so we have to account for that and you know deduct those from those samples especially from an environmental context um, like you said you know we're probably going to have maybe bits of fragments on plastic equipment so we try and remove plastic um, where feasible uh, and where affordable of course um, from our workflow as much as possible and um, we have to account for like airborne plastics and, and like I know you'll have in your lab Stephen it's like you know we have all these um, clean working benches uh, so for any students who are not aware of what those are it's like basically a positive pressure like high grade filtration of um, bench where they push air at you so that you as a user don't contaminate your samples with, with uh, DNA bacteria or plastic fibers for example um, you know, so having all this equipment is really helpful, but then something else that's definitely emerging from the field, and I think this is interesting for our student community to hear about, is the need, there, there's a sense of irony here where we have to spike our samples with known types of plastics um, and extract them and see how many we get at the end so that we can calculate what our percentage of success is in extracting plastics within a size range, because it gives us an idea about how good our extraction efficiency is. Um, and that's something that's relatively new in the field and something that this paper discusses. So, yeah, it's 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 challenging. Um, but in the lab environment, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a much more feasible way to approach it because, you know, it's a much cleaner working environment, which is nice, especially with these great fish that you're working at with. You know, I think there's a really cool research going on from in your in the lab's environment. So I'm you know interested to hear a bit more. But yeah, sorry, a bit of a brain dump, but just to like let people know, like, Plastics research, microplastics is, is definitely challenging to say the least, but uh, but exciting one at the same time. No, I, I appreciate that because I, I do. These are these are questions I know need to be addressed, and I don't know how to address them. <laughs> you know, because I, I and 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 too, like I, you know, I, I agree. It's to me, it's it's terrifying, right? Uh, it's it's much easier for me to control the 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 type of DNA that I'm putting into an experiment than the type of plastics. And, and on top of that, like, again, like, just not even knowing, like you're saying, like extracting the right chemical, right, and doing, doing what you know, or knowing what you're using in an experiment, rather than, um, you know, proprietary chemicals that nobody that the company doesn't want to tell you about um, having an effect is, is not, is not a comfortable experiment for me. <laughs> and so that's, that's something that I, I, uh, you know, I'm a little nervous about, but if, if, again, this is, this is, this is cool. This is cool stuff. It, it's, um, you know, I'm excited about doing it because it, you know, it's a little outside my wheelhouse <laughs> a lot maybe, but, um, but it's, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully we get some fun out of it. Sounds like Jillian has her work cut out for her, huh? Yeah. Yeah. She should be, um, I, I think they disappeared. Nope. They're still there. I can see it. She, she should be back in the lab. Her, her, 15, her 15 minutes is up. So <laughs> lots of things to figure out there. Yes. First of all, get rid of everything plastic in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> all the plastic bottles, but, um, no, it's, uh, it, I, I agree. I, I, I appreciate that view. That's, it's, uh, definitely something we need to think about. All right, we've got time for a few more questions if people have any. If not, 
right. If not, I guess we can uh, we can end the uh, seminar here, and we can thank uh, Dr. Weichsel for his time and, and his his uh, his approach here to see what we're, we're going to see at the end of the summer. So it's a, that's a that's a good way to say it. Approach, yeah, yes. an approach. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's everybody give a round of applause for uh, our speaker today. Thank you, Steve, for for joining us. Um, I'll. I'll stay on real here for a little bit, but um, if anyone has questions for me, uh, uh, I'll hang on for a few more minutes here. But otherwise, thanks, everybody, and I'll see folks uh, next week's seminar. I'll send out reminders, as always. So uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. There's your lab getting up and ready to go, and they're going. Yeah, I know. There they go. They're getting right back at it. That's yeah, see. good. Good. good, good. <laughs> Hey Jim, I'm, ne <laughs> I'm next week. Okay. Do you need anything from me? Um, um, uh, if if you want to send me a bio again, I, I don't know if I have it from last from last right, week. I yeah, always, I, I always post I it off websites and whatnot. Although I remember your website doesn't. Yeah, PC exist. doesn't like me. Um, <laughs> right, I, I'll, I'll look at the one from last year. I don't think anything's really changed much, but okay. I'll zap that to you. Um, yeah. Anything else I need to think about? No, I don't think so. You saw it. It's, you, you, you were you were one of our inaugural uh, speakers last last year, so you know how this goes. You saw this. It's, it's a good, you know, it's it's a great discussion usually. So it's um, I, I I'm enjoying it anyway. I hope the students are. <laughs> I I am I am, and yeah, thank you for doing this. I mean, it's it's nice to have seminars again. Yeah. Um. Thank so. you. Yeah, I agree. I agree. All right, I'm gonna bug out. Okay. Uh, bye, everyone. Bye, Steve. Right. I'll, I'll see you, Mark. I'll see you next. I'll see you next yeah. week. Jeff. Sorry. Bye. I, Everyone does that. I get everyone's names wrong. I tell you, it's high, it's, it's high pressure here. Right. Yeah. yeah, right. Bye. All right, Jim. Thank you very much. All right, Steve. I really appreciate it. I'll, I'll see you around. Yep. See you. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.